Awesome. and welcome to the Australian Coaches Conference. It is an absolute pleasure and a bit of an honour to be able to sit here with you and uh, talk some football. It is much appreciated. How are things? Things are quite busy at the moment for me because uh, I, I do a lot of work on Zoom like I do now with you. But uh, first of all, we'd like to greet all the coaches in Australia. I know it's a bit late for you, but uh, I uh, like the country because it's a very big country and a very sporty country. And uh, that's why I wanted as well to participate in this coaches meeting. And football, oddly enough, even though you might have heard things about Australian sport, football is the biggest sport, most played sport in Australia, which means it's the most coached sport in Australia as well. And we're going to talk about a number of things when it comes to, to coaching players in this wonderful game that we all love. Um, where did it start for you about wanting to be a coach and how did you educate yourself while you were still playing as well about becoming well, a coach? Uh, I just bring a book out about my life and uh, I, had, uh, I knew the intensity of my desire, of my passion. I didn't know where really it came from and uh, looking at my life, it certainly came from my childhood because I grew up in a little uh, bar, you know, where the headquarter of a local football club was in, 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 in this restaurant. So I heard only about football from a very young age and subconsciously I must have thought it's the only important thing in life because I heard about that every day. <laughs> How did you develop your, what would become extremely successful techniques about being a manager and being a coach? The, 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 uh, it's an interesting question because the difference between uh, uh, my childhood and today, during my childhood you had to fight to get information. Today you uh, are flooded with information and it's more problem today to select the right information. When I was a young boy it was more I had to chase, to fight when I came back at night with a good book or had seen a good training session somewhere, I was very happy because I thought I will be better tomorrow, you know. So I uh, had a career uh, and I did really uh, fight very hard to uh, do my education myself and I met as well people who helped me on that front. Who would you say are some of the people and, and if you can pass on some of the things that you were ingrained with very early on that, that helped you on this path? I would say that uh, the, the, our basic problem in football is uh, we have a limited time of training, you know, and uh, the basic problem of a coach is to use in a most efficient way the time he has available to practice. You cannot practice eight hours a day. So you practice one, hour, one and a half hours and maybe uh, if it goes well, a second session in the afternoon. So it, it is uh, the basic problem is the efficiency of our training. And the second uh, thing, of course, is the target uh, of your training sessions. And therefore, you have to know at what age do you do what, what kind of qualities you develop. and. Uh, as well, uh, it's about the duration of the training, the frequency, the increasing difficulty to make people progress. Uh, they need, of course, to be confronted with increasing difficulties. And that's why the programmation of the training sessions is something that is very important. Therefore, you have to learn how uh, do you progress? What is the, the training about? You know, It's not like tennis where you can repeat the movement. In football, you have to adjust your technique to each situation of the game and therefore it is important that uh, in every situation you face in the game, you're capable to respond technically and make the right decision. In the first stage of your life, I uh, would love to say that the football, the ball has to become your friend. You know, mm. and that means basically no matter where it comes from, he has to be welcome. <laughs> and uh, not kicked away straight away. Not kicked away straight away, unless it is in a place where it is in a better position. You know? But overall, 
the first target is to make of the ball your friend. Mm. My needs is always welcome. And uh, overall, I would say that uh, today, the technical level has dropped worldwide. And uh, the physical level in the last 10 years has improved a lot. But the technical level has dropped. Mm. And uh, even in the big games. So that's uh, something that is, of course, worked uh, very early in your life. Did, have you, are you referencing that against, say, when you were a player? You, you mentioned the last 10 years in particular. So we, we go back to when you had um, many successful years at Arsenal as well. But before that, when you were actually playing, you made it as a professional footballer. Do, do you notice that maybe that the technique of the player and the way that the ball was was um, manipulated and handled in a game by the be best players was a, of a different level than what it is now as opposed to the physical level back then which isn't quite where it is these days? Yes, uh, I, I believe that uh, the, the development of a game has produced uh, some problems and the, the evolution of the society as well has created some problems that we had not before. and. Uh, Overall, uh, people uh, play only in uh, uh, young boys today. They play only in structured training sessions. They do not play much outside the structured training sessions. That was not the case before. But they had long hours practice in the parks, in the streets. Uh, that doesn't exist anymore because kids uh, don't have that freedom anymore to go out and play together. You know. So the, that, uh, that the practice that uh, comes from uh, the non-structured training session has diminished and uh, the structured training sessions are today maybe a little bit uh, too much uh, guided and there's maybe not enough freedom. So I would say uh, today I always say to the young coaches, don't forget with the game as well is a very good coach. Mm. So dedicate always at least uh, the last part of your training session to a free game where the players can make decisions, make mistakes and think about why did I make that mistake, you know. That, it, I'll throw a, a very general one before we get into some specific stuff going forward, but that to a lot of people, I'm not sure if you subscribe to this theory, is what makes football so great, especially from a, a coaching angle, is that it looks so simple. Big rectangle pitch, square lines, a couple of curved lines, one ball, 11 players, rules don't change that much, even though technology has come in and changed some, some things. But the, overall, the game hasn't changed much in 150 whatever years, and yet it is so hard to perfect it. And that's what draws people in. Is that what drew, drew you in? Because you're always consistently, doesn't matter what stage you are in your career, you're always learning something about something in the game. Always, you know. And uh, overall, I must say uh, that uh, the game hasn't changed. It's the space available to play that has changed, you know. Uh, today, the game is much more compact and the time available to control the ball, to uh, make decisions, is much shorter than it was before. But uh, on, on the other hand, uh, uh, the basic rules have not changed. That means uh, you have to score goals and not to concede goals. But the way it is done today has a little bit changed. And overall, I must say, in the last 10 years, we have gone a little bit NBA basketball, you know. It's more individual, more f power, more speed, more explosivity, and, uh, but a little bit less. All the people who are a bit more creative and being kicked out of the game, basically. Would you say that it's going to turn back? Or are we on this endless pursuit of getting better physically and trying to make it quicker and quicker and quicker somehow? No, I would say we get to the end of what you can uh, get physically. You know, it's like uh, when you run 100 meter in 9.9 uh, seconds, uh, you can improve hundreds of seconds. But we are a little bit there now, I think, physically. And uh, uh, football's evolution is always like that. You know, you go a certain way after you realize that uh, 
The defenders find a solution against you, and the evolution is to find a new problem for the defenders, and the defenders respond again. So this reciprocity in the answers to a problem posed uh, creates the evolution. Now into some of the specifics, I want to talk obviously about your time at Arsenal and firstly when you walked through the door there in the, the mid-1990s and it, it might be good instructional value to all the coaches listening here that you walked into a dressing room which had the majority of players in, set in their ways about how they thought about preparing for football games, how they thought about football. How did you go about making your now famous changes, diet, um, application in training and all of those things? How did you decide to do what you were going to do? And why did you decide what you were going to do? I uh, would say football coach is, an adapt is a mixture of adaptation to the local culture and as well uh, non-compromise with what you think is important. And uh, I, that's what I try to do. I think some principles for me were I wasn't accept to, to uh, compromise in some aspects of the local culture that you have to respect. And uh, that's what I uh, did. And overall, I must say, uh, during my whole stay at Arsenal, there was an evolution. Because when I arrived in England, there was a, a team, was a monoculture team. They're all English. And uh, when you got convinced one, you had convinced the others. You know, they spoke together, they had a con and uh, they were playing together for 10 years. After, I created a little bit an injection of uh, a different culture. And in the end, uh, uh, it, then it became a multicultural team. And uh, when I left, it was, uh, of course, a very multicultural team. But as well, what was new, it was a multicultural team, not necessarily coming from outside the country. It is people inside the country who have a live in their local community and uh, come to play football in England. They've been educated in England, mm -hmm. but they still live. The Indians live with the Indians, the Africans with the Africans, the Jamaican with the Jamaican, you know. So you have to find, in a modern coach, has to find a, a midway, culture-wise, where you can, everybody can agree. And uh, the target was to find a common culture for us inside the club. And I tried to create a cultural level where everybody agreed with to behave. Hmm. How was that though initially with the big personalities? Because big players in England have big personalities and they have a hmm. big say in how football clubs are run. How did you not have that fear that you were going to be kind of pushed back from well, the uh, big First players? of all, I would say uh, I had never a notoriety problem. I don't know really why. And, uh, but as well, I, I would say, if you can convince the leaders inside the team, if they are on your side, they make you stronger. If you are against you, you lose the battle, you know, mm. they make you weaker. So you have always, if you can convince the top leaders inside the team, the way you want to behave, the way you want to play football, the way you want uh, to defend and attack, they, they will help you. Uh, so it is always a, a quite a, a, a communication that has to exist and the strengths of your beliefs have to be clear. You need clarity hmm. to convince people. And I would say uh, uh, during my whole career, we have gone from a, a vertical uh, way to make your job to a more horizontal way to make your job. That means They've gone to a guy who gives orders, who are followed, mm. and uh, in today the modern manager is more persuasive one. You know, he has to persuade people to individualize the training because everybody is now different profiles that you have to adjust the training sessions to them, and uh, he has as well to be open-minded. Mm. That means he gets so many informations today that he has to select the data that uh, can help him to find the solution to his problems. But he gets flooded 
with information and the modern manager has to select the important data that can help him to make his team more efficient. What was the most important data for you with Arsenal? Look, uh, in my whole career, I tried always uh, to create objective measurements uh, of my observations. I had, uh, I had facts, I had how I felt uh, uh, about the facts and how I, I, uh, what kind of a decision I was inclined to make. But then I thought if I had a bit more rationality in the world where I live, I could understand better the world where I live in. Mm. And uh, science maybe can help me to understand better the world where I live in. So I always tried to quantify the performances of the players with uh, statistics and with uh, programs that can uh, uh, quantify the performance. I try to quantify the physical work of the players on the football pitch. So I was the first to sign contracts in England with uh, uh, companies who could test how much the players won. So I, I got as many informations uh, uh, around me I could. And at the end of the day, your expertise helps you to take a distance with that and make the right decision. For example, uh, a scientist, I give you an example. Uh, you play a big game tomorrow and the uh, scientist comes in and say, look, uh, this player, his uh, performance in training in the last week physically was very poor. He looks tired and uh, therefore I would have a doubt about him. Then comes your knowledge of the player, first of all, and his character and you know, and his history. For example, I could know, okay, this player has in mind, this week I play a big game and I give a bit less in training because I, I, I want my full energy. Yeah. Or you know, through history, in a big game, this guy plays always well, you know? And uh, so, because you, you, have, uh, you are the expert who has the knowledge, you can put the information you get at a distance and then make the right decision. But it can help you to make the right decision. Can you give us the name of the player that you're thinking of there, by any chance, just as a little side no, thing? Uh, <laughs> I, I talk about that in my book. For example, when you watch Tony Adams play, yeah. in the training sessions, you would never play him on Saturday. <laughs> but when the game started on Saturday, he was always the best defender. <laughs> Which is maybe why he played the amount of football that he did. He looked after himself during the week, football-wise, maybe. <laughs> they, they know. Once the players have 30 years or are 30 years old, you know, that uh, this is a, a, an interesting thing. And uh, I must say that uh, the evolution of a player during the career is something that is very interesting. In the recent studies we made, uh, I made with, some, with a friend of mine, we tried to analyze what's happening. For example, you have a group of young talented players between 17 and 20, okay? Yeah. And we studied all of them, for example, Messi, Ronaldo, we, we have their numbers. From 17 to 20, in every country, we have a group of talented I'm long enough in the job to tell you this guy has not a chance to make a career. But there's a group of players who are all talented, but you don't know who will be a big player hmm. or who will make, be better than the others. At the age of 20, what is interesting, there's a first separation between the few players and the rest. They cope more with pressure, they are more consistent in training maybe, they can cope with the fact that on, the, on Sunday you have to deliver the performance. And then what is interesting, at the age of 23, there's another separation of the very, very good ones and the rest. Hmm. And uh, because at 23, you're a full professional who knows his job, you know. And then you show as well, how much sacrifices are you ready to make? If at 23, you're not the right created for yourself, the right environment to perform, 
you will never make it. And uh, that is uh, something interesting for people who develop young players uh, and uh, to develop this kind of uh, qualities that I call character. And uh, it's different from personality. Yeah, it, that, is, yeah. that is one of the hardest things to do because not only you're a football coach manager, but you have to be like a psychologist to, 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 to organize your own thoughts about what thoughts are happening. You know, because, because, uh, because uh, you, uh, the best revelation of a character is the game. In the game, I can tell you, I watch a player play, I can give you his character. Because in your game, you get all a read of all the social pro uh, protections that you have built, mm. and you become who you really are. You know? And uh, sometimes people say, uh, he's a very nice guy, but under the football pitch, he, he's a bastard. I always say to a guy, if you do something important with this guy, he will become who he is really. You know, <laughs> that means uh, don't go uh, into business with him. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> don't go into business with him because he will be exactly who he is in the game. Who and, uh, who impresses you greatly in that regard? Then, in the modern day, give like some examples, perhaps that that you can look, see uh, the character screams to you. What what uh, for me character is based on the qualities that are very important to develop at a young age. Because this is something that you can convince people to carry. It's the values. Character is for me who you really are. And that is based on honesty, courage, integrity, fortitude, honor, you know, and uh, is who you really are. Personality is what we see today in the modern game is uh, linked with the social media, with a with media interest, is who you pretend to be. You know, I uh, sell your personality, but it's not who you really are. But this, this kind of qualities I spoke to you in the character, you can develop at the age of 14, 15, 16 in your team by emphasizing these qualities. How did you cope in your latter years with Arsenal? How did you cope with those players as soon as they got back to the dressing room? The phone came out and they like started taping themselves and everything part of their life seemed to be on Instagram or, or Twitter or whatever their chosen part yeah. was. Did you relate to that somehow? Look, I, uh, I did fight against it. And, uh, but uh, I spoke with many coaches. And everybody says now, uh, you know, it's a lost battle because uh, the players go even to the toilets and with their phone and uh, you, you cannot stop it, you know. So I, I created rules accepted by everybody. But uh, it, this, the, what you just showed, the phone, shows that when I started to manage or to coach at the age of 33, I was the... But basically, the only influence on the player. Hmm. Today, the manager has to share his influence and sometimes to combat uh, the influence of other people on the, on the player because you have the agents, uh, they have their own physio, they have their own dietitian, they have their own entourage that sometimes works against you. You know, mm. that's why the connection and the dynamic and uh, the communication that you have with the player is absolutely vital. Do you, did you communicate how differently to certain personalities and characters in terms of who you could get angry with quickly or who you had to cuddle a bit more before you finally lost your temper, as an example? Yes, uh, I basically I must say overall, us coaches overrate our capacity to communicate. And basically, what we overrate the most is our efficiency of our communication, you know. And uh, therefore, it is very important, uh, I would say, what I learned about the efficiency is I always tried first to open the door of the player. Because when he came to my office, he knew he was not ready to congratulate him usually, you know. 
So I, I ask him, I ask them always first uh, their opinion about the situation. Secondly, you have always to to give them two or three positive things they are doing to open the door, the receptivity of the player, and then tell him what you expect more of him, you know, and uh, to give him a clear picture then of what you expect from him. And then you have to check what he understood of your conversation, because you are sometimes surprised. You speak to a player and uh, you think, okay, I've t told him uh, what I wanted, and he goes back and he communicates with other people around him. Mm. You think it's completely different to what you thought you have convinced him of. <laughs> yeah, lost in translation. How, how do you communicate? Because it's, you don't get much time on the training pitch, for instance, but like whatever you mentioned before, you, you, your contact time with them is not great. So how did you individualize your communication with players around I, training, uh, around I, games, all yeah. of that? I got them into my office. Sometimes I used my assistants. But I had a clear picture of the distance between the player and me, you know. And uh, at the beginning of the week, I thought I set myself target. This week, I have to speak to him because uh, I feel him too far from me at the moment. I have to get him back a little bit closer in our communication again. Mm. And uh, so I had a clear picture of the uh, distances between the players and myself. And I had targets to keep, keep the communication going, you know. And uh, as well, let's not forget that we produce in a squad of 25, we produce every Friday 14 jobless people, yeah. you know. They go home, they feel useless, they feel not rewarded for the effort they put in and they hate you, you know. Mm. So you have to, to keep the energy going into the team, you had to get these people on Monday morning and say, look, my guy, I employ you again now and you have to give your best again, you know. And that's why uh, this is such a sensitive and uh, difficult job. How did you manage success? And I ask that because the easy thing to do when you win a game is to gloss over what you think is a problem. Um, I mean, you had a run there at one point with Arsenal where 49 games in the Premier League, you didn't have a problem, <laughs> so to speak, because you didn't lose. How, how did you ensure that little bad habits, and they quite obviously didn't because you didn't lose a game for so long, didn't become big problems later? How did you communicate that? Yes, we didn't lose a game for one and a half years. People don't realise what that means, you know, because you're always a, a tricky game where you go out, it's windy at Newcastle, and. <laughs> Uh, in the middle of November and rainy, uh, the decisions go against you, but you still don't lose, you know. And uh, so that demands, of course, I, I would say by uh, creating a long-term target inside the head of the players and a short-term target. I, I uh, thought, I told them I want to play, win a, a championship without losing a game. And they laughed at me. But uh, in 2003, it didn't work. We didn't win the championship. We finished second. And the players told me, you put too much pressure on, on us because uh, it's impossible to win the championship without losing a game. Nobody ever did it. And I told them, I just think you can do it if you really want it. You know, so uh, somewhere, the seeds that you put in the brain take time to become reality. But it, a long-term target is needed. And the short-term target is, of course, everybody will adjust to what you have done and uh, what, how can you improve what we did in the last game. And uh, therefore, I believe as well, I personally tried uh, to go home every, after every game and think, what have I done wrong today? Why did, was the changes I made during the game right? Uh, did I pick the right team? Uh, did I not make a mistake here and there, you know? Or at the moment, uh, this guy is not happy uh, straight away on Monday morning. I have to get him into my office. And uh, so I try to be uh, very critical with myself. And I must say I had uh, exceptional players. What is exceptional players? I usually, all the people I met in my life who have uh, 
been consistent and uh, had top quality. Our people had a very objective assessment of their performance by being a bit harsh with themselves, you know. And I had uh, players who refused to be average. Yeah, you had a few of those, especially in that team. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned Newcastle there. I'm actually a Newcastle fan, so I won't go into Alan Shearer and some of the uh, things that he... It, 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 it is for me, after uh, Arsenal, it's my second biggest love uh, in England. Because, just for one simple reason, there's a... Uh, I like the North in general, yep. but... Uh, but basically, it is because there is such a huge potential there. Tell me about it. And such a huge passion, <laughs> and uh, they don't move forward. Uh, tell me about it. That's why I'm losing my hair, Arsene. Anyway, we won't go into Newcastle. We've got better things to talk about. Just on during that time then, so everything's going well. Um, but for those games, you are leaving some seriously very good footballers without many minutes playing, and you mentioned there before about having them in the office and, and that. It, it seemed that that time was the, the perfect synchronicity between the right character, wonderfully gifted footballers, and yes. guys who were mentally strong enough to realise that they were part of something special so they, they wouldn't complain, they wouldn't ring up the agent and say, oh, I've got this problem with the manager and all that. It, it seemed like a, a perfect coming together of all the things that you need and all the things that any coach really craves. Yes, it is. Uh, it doesn't happen a lot in your life, you know, and uh, therefore it's sometimes miraculous. What is interesting, in 2003, uh, we did win the championship. I brought only one player in and it was Jens, you know. Hmm. But he was another guy who was refusing to lose and was ready to fight with everybody in every single training game to, to win the game. So it just was sometimes what I mean, the balance of a team, is it mental balance, is it technical balance, hmm. depends sometimes on one player. Yeah, and that obviously lifted it up a notch. What about, I mentioned about managing success, how do you go about the, the flip side about managing failure and trying to get back that thing that disappears out the dressing room door sometimes but we don't know how to get it back easily confidence in players how did you go about that process it is true it is uh, first of all by uh, most of the time is uh, by uh, when you and you become get under huge pressure you know what is a what is a consequence of a huge pressure that you're under is first of all, you can become aggressive with people and uh, therefore you diminish even more their confidence or you become passive. That means escape the problem by, <laughs> by uh, not facing the real problems. So I would advise the best thing is uh, to try to take a distance like on a helicopter and look at the problems from a distance, you know, what's going on there, why do I analyze well, uh, cold-blooded, uh, without any big emotion, because you have resentment when you lose games. So it is important to get that uh, uh, used to that exercise, to take a distance and create a strategy and explain to the players how we get, can get it right again and make the right decisions. Uh, therefore, that is uh, something that is very important, is that capacity to look at the bigger picture mm. and, uh, and after not compromise when you, ha when you are convinced, go for it, you know. And uh, I, I believe that is absolutely a, a very important quality. Once you have, uh, you have always to question yourself, once you have to, an opinion, mm. why am I here? Why am I doing this? What is important to me? And get back uh, once you have made this analysis to really be uh, without compromise. How hard is it to tell a player that has given you absolutely everything, his heart and soul, to the cause, that perhaps now is the time to... Like, yeah, I, I look at Liverpool at the moment, for instance, Jurgen Klopp, and he has obviously got this massive connection with his players and they give so much to him, but at some point those players 
are going to run, be not the players that they are right now, and he's going to have to maybe have a conversation that is very difficult. How do you weigh that up in terms of what the player has given you personally? Look, it, it's very sensitive. It's a very sensitive job on that front. Mm -hmm. When I arrived at Arsenal, I had nine players who were 30 and above. And I said to my assistants, if we survive with this team, we do a good job. Because you have to tell, at some stage, I have to tell each of them, my friend, it's over, mm -hmm. you know. And that uh, uh, demands uh, honesty, uh, communication and respect and as well uh, uh, to be uh, harsh in your decision you know because you you don't you know when uh, you're 34 you play against the 25 uh, you uh, have a problem you know in the big games so this is something that uh, where the manager has to be really honest and uh, the tendency is uh, I read many times the papers, like you certainly as well, and the guy says, yes, I've been told or I have got an email or got a, a text message that I will not uh, renew my contract anymore. Huh. That is not uh, uh, the right way to do things. It has to be face to face and uh, uh, it's not the easiest part of your job, but it's part of it. Hmm. Can we talk about the, the youth? Um, development side and how involved were you with Arsenal's youth development in the time you were there? I, I always remember uh, watching uh, League uh, Cup games with Arsenal. Two years I was very involved in that hmm. and I would say uh, today I would say you have different stages of development of the players you know you have a uh, five six years old where the first uh, uh, I would say the duration of the sessions is uh, every 10 minutes you have to give them a reason and then have a drink and come back. You know, you have to adapt yep. to psychological development of the players. When you have seven to nine years old, where it's a more already more structured training sessions, when you have nine to 11, where they start a little bit to do uh, things with their partners, and then you have 12 to 16, where the first uh, Prompts is uh, uh, as a team play have to be uh, uh, boarded, and then you have the 17 to 21 where it becomes more position specific training, you know, and uh, with the integration after in the first team. Mm. But after, uh, I think it's important to, to have these categories and then adapt every time the duration of the training the frequency of the training and of course the content of the training and therefore I will create in, the, in Zurich uh, a center of research to adjust uh, the important ingredients in the training sessions of the young players and I believe that uh, one of the big mistakes uh, today in the academies is that uh, uh, it's too early too much uh, talk of a team structure, you know, and at an age where the boys uh, don't understand that and uh, are not interested in that. When you learn to play football, it's first me and the ball. Hmm. Yeah, otherwise you, because if you don't have the ball, you're running <laughs> to get it back. Uh, no, no, if you don't have the ball, you, you, you lost the ball psychologically. So, and if I give a ball even to a partner, I lost the ball because I don't understand the reciprocity at a very young age, you know? Yeah. So, you, you have to individualize more the exercises linked with the psychological development of the players. Then, first in the development, it becomes me, the ball, and my partners. So, you can make passing uh, and connections, develop the connections. Then it becomes later me, the ball, the partners, and the opponents, you know. And uh, so this has always to be structured in the training session in the development of the players. What, what ages would you say for those, for those ones that you just mentioned there, the, the development blocks? Is that keeping with the five to six, <laughs> seven to nine, and so yeah, on? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, 
Therefore, it is really important that uh, you know what you work on at what age. For example, the speed can be the, the speed that means the capacity to repeat a movement at a high pace can be developed between 12 and uh, 14, 15. If you don't do that at that age, a guy will be who he is, but he can miss a career because of that. You know, so we want to. I want to create uh, a research lab where we can absolutely quantify what you have to work, what kind of quality have you to develop in the, at each age. So is it like a? Are you getting data in from every part of the world because obviously conditions are different in in, in parts of the world? How are you going to accomplish this one? Uh, by uh, making research on uh, neuroscience as well. Uh, and on uh, observations, on data as well, but mainly on neuroscience to know exactly at what age you do what. Because I come back to the most important thing we spoke about at the start, is don't waste your time. You know, the other day I was out there and I was uh, uh, on my bike in a the park. There was a guy making a training session with uh, players of 14, 15 years old. And because I turned around the park, I, uh, I saw the guy on the board with uh, moving on the board and the guys were freezing and watching him for 10, 15 minutes, we moved one, one piece after the other piece on the board. And I, at the end, I stopped, I said to him, please give him the ball and let them play football, you know, because they see that demonstrations on television yeah. and uh, they think to be a good coach, you have to be tactically absolutely sure. But uh, that, the boys are there to play football. <laughs> what, um, what did the coach say when uh, he's got a three-time Premier League winner and uh, Arsene Wenger <laughs> coming up and telling him what to do in the park? <laughs> they wanted to make a photo after. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't a Tottenham fan, was he? No, no. Oh, good, good. I don't think so. <laughs> Uh, interesting story, yeah. I mean, what about, um, because a lot of coaches in the youth space, the boys, the boys and girls want to win. That's a natural instinct that they have no. because they play football. What about the coach's role in trying, getting them to play to win? Where do you sit with that? Well, uh, I have nothing against that. When I was a kid, I wanted absolutely to win, and when I was a coach, when you last, when you want to last in the job as a, like a coach, you have to win, you know, hmm. or you don't last. So I have nothing against that. It is how do you win? What is the best way to win? You know, and therefore I come back to the basics. I told you football is a technical sport because at the end of the day, uh, when I played against Barcelona. It was not the poorest players on, on uh, the other side who made me lose, it was Messi, you know. <laughs> and uh, therefore, uh, ideally, you would want to produce 11 Messi in, in, in each team, in each position. So, mm. I, I believe that, uh, of course, to win is absolutely important, but uh, to convince the players is uh, what is the, how is the best way to win football games. What about the key aspects of the youth player as he gets a little older, as he edges towards perhaps, or she, a, a senior career or breaking into that, you know, early 20s? Side, and I mentioned before about the League Cup, the number of times I watch a League Cup game and, and you put out a side with players with numbers 79 or 83 or whatever, and yeah. you've got them straight out of the academy. So you've seen that they're right. What, what are the things that you identify greatly in a young player that makes you believe that they've got... The, the aptitude to, to be able to um, mix it against Look, uh, adults. what I try to uh, identify, first of all, is one dominant quality. Well, none of us, unfortunately, is all the qualities, and uh, therefore you try always to find one dominant quality. After, is he capable to, has he passion? Is he intelligent? Can he uh, use his dominant quality in an efficient way? Sometimes it is a, a guy who's very uh, aggressive. Sometimes it's a guy who has a very good technique. Sometimes it's a guy who has fantastic stamina. But you need to see one dominant, need one dominant quality and be good at the, at the other qualities needed. And I always try to, to see that. Hmm. What, where is he strong at? And after, you have to put him in a position that is suited 
to his uh, profile, psychological profile or, or physiological profile as well. For example, if a guy has no stamina and playing in midfield, uh, you're kidding. You know, he, will not, he will not survive. Uh, if a guy is uh, very strong in the challenge, but has an, an average stamina, he can still play centre back. Mm. Who was intelligent? Who had the biggest dominant quality you've ever seen in football, if you know what I mean? Uh, it depends what quality you want. If you were uh, per technically perfect, it's Burkham. You know? yeah. I, I haven't seen him in, in uh, 15 years neglecting one control in training. When he missed the pass, he was upset with himself. So uh, if you had uh, Thierry Henry, uh, had all the qualities, uh, basically. Uh, so uh, he had the physical qualities, he had the uh, technical qualities. So Pires, Exceptional technique, mm. you know, except, exceptional intelligence uh, of the game. So, Ljungberg had a fantastic runner off the ball. The timing of his runs was exceptional, so you had to put him into play in, in a position where he can get the timing of his run uh, right, you know. So, it is a, uh, you have to see what is uh, their strengths and then put them in a position where they can use their strengths. And then it's all easy <laughs> with the quality of player. Um, what about, I'll ask you one about Japan. Um, your time with Nagoya there in, in Japan, we've got two Australian managers there actually, Peter Klamowski at, um, at Shimizu and also Ange Postacoglu, who won the title with Yokohama F Marinos last season. What did your time, your, your short time there, because you left to take the Arsenal job in the mid-90s, what did you get out of Japanese football and, and the key learnings out of that particular environment? What I got out is, first of all, it was a country that was very well organised to structure the game. You know, they did very quickly create academies, they uh, transformed the company football into professional football in a very efficient way. And uh, what I learned as well is that it is a country that is naturally suited for team sport. So they want always to help the collectivity. Mm. They think naturally, what can I do for the global uh, company, you know? What can I do for the team? So, uh, and as well, it is a country that likes uh, to be technically perfect. They like the beauty of the movement in, the, in Japan. So they were sometimes not efficient enough in the execution of their movement because it was more worried about how beautiful it is yeah. and how efficient it is, you know. And uh, uh, on the other hand, they were agile, flexible, light feet, uh, light feet, what is very important in the game. The deficit was they had, uh, they had no uh, power. Mm not enough power, not enough body power, and not enough height, especially defensively. And uh, uh, the other deficit they had was uh, the individual initiative, you know. They are more used that the collectivity takes the decision than the individual. But on a football pitch, uh, it is more the individual in each situation has to make a good decision. So at the start, that was difficult to get them uh, to be used to do that. Just on the, the some of the attributes you've, that have come out in this chat so far about individual players, so it's it's quick feet, quick thought, good technique. Those are the things that really appeal to you in, in terms of being a being the chance to make it as a footballer. Yes, because a footballer is uh, basically when you play football uh, to make it as simple as possible. You welcome the ball. You make a decision and you execute your decision. No? So you have first to be perfect at welcoming the ball. As I told you, it has to be your friend. Mm. Then you have to make the right decision. Then to have to execute your decision perfectly. Knowing that the decision you have made, you have to be flexible with it because the situation can change very quickly around you. But what I did in my final uh, year, two years, I worked with the university and I, I wondered what happened before I get the ball. So I studied uh, with them what does a football player do in the ten, 10 seconds before he gets the ball. For example, 
how many times does he take information in the last 10 seconds before he gets the ball? Hmm. And we, we made a huge study you know, with cameras on the roof of a, of, a, of a stadium because you have to look even at the movement of the eyes. It was uh, very difficult. Yeah. And we found out that the very good players take six to eight times information before they get the ball in the last 10 seconds. The, the less good players four to six times, you know. And so there is a link. We could prove that there is a link with the number of informations you take in the last 10 seconds before you get the ball. Why do I tell you that? Because when I told you before that in your training sessions, uh, you have to be influenced by that. It means how can you use, then I ask you two questions. When, uh, how can you use that? In creating, how do you create exercises who force the player to take information? But even more so, at what age is that quality developed? But I cannot give you the answer at the moment because I don't know. Yes, because you're doing this research lab and that might tell, tell us more, yeah? Yeah, exactly. That's what, that, that's what I want to know. Hmm. That, that role with FIFA, it's not just this, is it, is it other things as well? The global development chief, it, it sounds like a, um, a wide-ranging role. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, uh, it is, when you look at football in the world, you would say Europe is ahead of the rest of the world. So, and the gap is getting bigger, I think. Uh, basically, uh, when you look at the World Cup now, it's a European Championship uh, with a little bit Brazil and uh, Argentina. All the other teams had no chance to win it. Mm. And the last final was Croatia, 3 million people Croatia against uh, France, you know. So, uh, it, it is, a, 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 for me, I know that I grew up without any coach, with nobody helping me. Until the age of 19, I had no coach and I spent my life in football as a coach. So it is a miracle. But I am conscious as well that uh, FIFA has a responsibility to give everybody in the world a chance to play football. Mm. And uh, if we can do that, we, uh, we are doing well. If we can reduce the difference between Europe and the rest of the world, we are doing well, you know. And uh, of course, I will start that work. I will certainly, uh, uh, that will take uh, decades maybe, but it has to be done. Don't forget about Australia as well while you're doing it all. I'm sure you won't after this chat, hopefully. So, hey, um, are you still watching football religiously every day? Or do you have days off now that you don't watch football? I don't have uh, days where I don't watch football. When I wake up in the morning and I know there's a game at night, it's not the same day for me. <laughs> you know, it is... Uh, it is like somebody like to go to disco, I like to watch football. <laughs> so you can't remember the last day that you had without watching one, uh, some form of football? No. Wow. Uh, even when I uh, was manager, I watched football uh, the whole way night. But no better weekend than us playing first, winning the game and watching the rest of the weekend all football. Is that what you'd do? You'd, you'd leave Highbury or the Emirates, say, if you're playing at home? and it was the 12.30 Saturday game, you get home as soon as you can after having to deal with the pesky press and all of that, and then for the rest of the weekend, you'd want to watch football on the couch. Exactly, That's what, that was my life. I'm sometimes a bit ashamed to say that, but it's, it, 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 honestly, it's true. How do, you, how do you watch football then? Do you watch it like the, the normal person watches it in terms of looking for players and techniques, but, or do you, watch it from a different standpoint, given your experience? I watch it sometimes like a normal spectator, just to enjoy it, you know, when it becomes passionate, uh, uncertain. And sometimes I dedicate time to, let's see how many good passes they make on the trot, you know. Hmm. Uh, and I watch it more from a tactical point of view, how compact are they, what is that problem, the manager should change now, why does he not change, uh, like uh, people did for me, you know, uh, <laughs> things like that. No, they never did that to you. No one can remember those. <laughs> it's normal that you do that because it's a part of a game as well. How did you... Keep... you... Sorry, 
on, on like getting no. advice from outside, how do you kind of take that on board? Because you're always getting advice as a football manager. Well, uh, I, I try to see what is uh, right and, and wrong, what is based on emotions. And for example, uh, sometimes uh, you criticize because people uh, want you to win the game and uh, they lost the game because our supporters and they, they think they've done that wrong or bad uh, or not. So I try to analyze why is a criticism. And sometimes it was paid on hate, you know, so mm. then I didn't consider it at all. But you have to be open-minded. I always said to my groundsmen, you know, you can say I have this opinion and you can be right and I can be wrong. The difference is out of 10 decisions, I will be right eight times and you too. <laughs> How did you... And it's the same. With the grass, I can be. I have my opinions about the, the grass, but he was more times right than I was. And he always prepared, uh, prepared a beautiful pitch as well for you to play on the type of football that you wanted to play. Plus, we had the best groundsman in the world. <laughs> it was like a billiard table every time you guys played at home. It wasn't fair for the teams that wanted to just lump it. <laughs> it helped you guys too much. Um, just on back to evolving as a manager and evolving your style and. I mean, even now that you're, you're watching a lot of football without the day-to-day -day involvement with a football team, do you, would you say that you would do things differently to what you did five years ago or you started your time at Arsenal? Yes, I, uh, I would uh, try to adapt to the evolution of the game, of course, and uh, uh, do things differently and some things I wouldn't change at all because I think uh, some things are neglected as well today that uh, I will continue to work on. Overall, uh, you have to go with evolution. And I do not say you have to go with evolution. I think you have to try to be ahead of the evolution, you know, to anticipate. Hmm. I started at the age of 33 years old in the top league in France. I was surrounded by uh, people who were maybe more talented than I was, but they all disappeared. Because they refused to evolve. Hmm. And uh, so you have always tried to think. I believe when you coach or manager, you have to create a culture of performance inside the club, inside the organization. You have to create an environment that allows the team to perform. To do that, the leader first has to have that attitude, you know? That means he has to carry the values of and have a clear picture. I want to get better. How can I get better? And when you have that attitude, then you want, need a, a clear picture of the gap of where you are and where you want to be. And push the team then to improve. They must feel that you want to move forward. Hmm. And uh, that creates... Uh, a real culture of performance. So your training sessions were very different from the start of your time at Arsenal, for instance, or the start of your time as a manager at 33 in France? They were the completely end. different. Yeah? They were different. Although I think today, the modern manager, uh, when I started to coach, it was me and the team and nobody else. My credibility came from the quality of my sessions. Today, the manager doesn't do the sessions. Mm -hmm. He has uh, five, six specialists around who tell him what they will do on the day and we select the team or, and the players who play on Saturday and communicate well outside. But he's less, he's less a hand-on man than uh, I was when I started uh, the job. Were you, were you still hands-on um, with Arsenal to the end, or with the sessions? Or? Until the end. I did all the training sessions until the end, yes. I was educated like that and I continued like that, you know. Hmm. And, uh, and I loved it as well. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, what styles of managers do you appreciate now that you're watching a lot of football? Obviously, the, the Premier League is, is close to where you are, so you've been watching a lot of that. Uh, I don't know them well, but uh, today the managers are more image conscious, you know. Uh, they walk on the pitch after the game. I hate all that, you know. Uh, uh, greet, shake hands, be, even if they want to, uh, uh, they feel that uh, uh, they uh, don't feel a 
at all the way they behave. But, uh, so I think uh, today managers are very image conscious, much more, and they use that very well on the cameras. But I don't know them well individually, you know, as person. And uh, I prefer, I think, uh, you have to leave a stage to the players and be as visible as possible, personally, you know. And uh, uh, so I, I, I don't know them well, but uh, I look at that team and how they play football. <laughs> and when you watch, this is more important to me. This is more yeah. important to me than uh, uh, to have conversations. Fair enough. Um, how did speaking of conversations? How did you approach half-time chats? Because you've only got a little amount of time to get across a big message. No, I uh, let them first recover always and have a little chat together sometimes uh, and then uh, two, three minutes before you come up uh, out again and uh, uh, have a, a chat to tell them what to change and what you have to do better and what we have to continue to do, what we are doing well. It's funny because when you ask uh, many times in France, you know, they interview the players uh, when uh, they come out after the, the half time. Mm. Sometimes you feel after the game, the coach he said, I changed this, I changed that, and it changed. When you ask the players, you didn't get that message at all, you know? Because the players at half time are not always very receptive on details of, uh, of coaching. Difficult. How long after a match did you start thinking of your first training session that you were going to have with the players again? Uh, not very long after. Yeah. I thought we have to work this or that, you know, and uh, you think about what you will do uh, the two or three days after. When I was at Arsenal, I, I managed 1,235 games in 20 years, so that means most of the time uh, you played every three days. You had not much. Uh, once the season had started, you were always playing. Mm. Now you've got a lot more time to consider things with this new role. Um, what would you say, if we sat here and had another conversation in five years' time, what would be your hope that you've helped evolve football with this role that you've got with FIFA and, and where you want to take it? Well, I would say uh, I hope that uh, we could get structured football, uh, organised championships more in Africa, you know, where the youth team, the young players can play in five years. I hope we will have moved forward with educational level all over the world. Educated coaches, educate people, coach the coaches. And uh, uh, the game itself, I believe that uh, the evolution will be natural because that comes with the quality of the players that you educate. And one last one, you've got to give the book one last plug as well because it's Christmas is around the corner, it could be under a few Christmas trees. So um, what was the experience like for you and, and the name of it and all of that? Well, it was uh, difficult because I don't like to talk about myself. I resisted for three or four years to do the book and in the end I did it because I had a bit of time available and I thought as well. Maybe one day somebody in my family asked, uh, what did this guy do? and I uh, will be interested to my life. But I wanted as well to show people that life can be bigger than you dream, you know. And uh, that it is linked as well with coincidence and luck. But uh, you have to give your best. And uh, thing I wanted to share with people maybe is a bit uh, what I learned about human being, you know can always surprise you in a good way, as well as unfortunately sometimes in a bad way. <laughs> but we try to remember the good. Um, Arsene Wenger, thank you so well, much for being a part of the Australian Coaching Conference. Um, hopefully the, the coaches watching have got something little, something big out of that to take forward. We really appreciate your time. Best of luck with it. I all. wish you uh, good luck. Thank you very much, mate, and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you very much.